I have a couple of caveats that I'm going to start with. One, anything stupid I say is my fault. Anything smart I say is TechCrunch's. So that's, that's the way that works. That it all belongs to them, anything smart I say. Um, beyond that, uh, I also want to extend an invitation to any journalists or J school students who are in the room who want to write for TC, um, pitch me. So you can reach me on Twitter at Jay Schieber, my first initial last name. My email is my last name at techcrunch.com. So um, if you want to pitch me stuff, uh, feel free. That said, I'm starting, I'm starting with that right now because I'm about to tell you we're going from success to failure, uh, which is sort of the, the abject dissolution of the TechCrunch uh, Contributors Network, which I was responsible for um, driving into the ground. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, maybe don't pitch me. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, I want to I want to start off with a little bit of context as well, um, and just give sort of my two cents about where contributors and this notion of a contributed content sort of started, at least as far as as I'm concerned or as far as I see it. Um, and it really, for me, began with the Huffington Post. So you have Ariana Huffington, Jonah Peretti, um, Breitbart, and uh, <laughs> and Ken Lehrer, who is uh, was a pitchman for AOL. Really, it all comes back to AOL. AOL's been the topic of conversation all day today. It's been pretty fascinating to see how far those tentacles have 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 stretched and reached. Um, Ken Lehrer was was the uh, was was the PR guy for AOL, responsible for shilling the Time Warner AOL merger uh, to the press and to the public at large, which he had then admitted was a terrible thing. And he was like, "I knew it was going to be an abject failure. I sold all my shares um, as soon as I could." And I thought it was a shitty idea. So you know, there you go. There's there's ethics and journalism for you right there. Um, so that said, <laughs> there there you go. There's the beginning of the contributors network. It starts with with Huffington Post, and then it just goes downhill from there. I'm kidding, sort of. Uh, and then you have Forbes, which I think really sort of reinvented the wheel as far as contributors go, um, and and turned their entire publication on. Um, on premise their entire publication really on contributors and the strength or weakness thereof. Um, that was in 2010, and because AOL is such an early adopter, uh, you know, five years later, they decided that we should do it at TechCrunch. Uh, so we did. Um, it was a directive that came from on high. Uh, I think that um, the person who was responsible for, for the overall sort of media strategy at that point was a guy named, named Luke Beatty. Um, and Luke was enamored with the, the notion of contributors and sort of the, the force multiplier they could bring in terms of traffic and eyeballs. Um, this is my sense anyway. Uh, and so decided that we should, of course, have one at TechCrunch. Um, TechCrunch, a little bit about the institution, is a fairly uh, flat organization where reporters and editors are pretty much on the same page. It's, it's more like there's, we sort of suggest maybe things that people might want to write about, and then people just tell us to fuck off and do their own thing anyway. So that's the way that works. Um, and, and it's great, and it's worked really well. It's sort of a controlled chaos that's managed to, to survive and thrive, I think, in a, in a particularly challenging media environment, especially as there's been a lot of people who are coming on to the tech scene and really looking at tech as a way to expand their coverage and, and um, increase eyeballs, uh, because tech is becoming more prevalent everywhere, ubiquitous. So uh, Luke said, guys, do a contributor network. And then everyone came to me and said, John, why don't you do the contributors network? And I said, I really don't want to do this. And they said, please. And so I did. Um, and f it, there was a revolt among staff. And it, it started. A, it caused a lot of problems. It caused a lot of problems. Um, journalistic integrity, surprising or not, is a thing at TechCrunch that they sort of privilege. Um, and, and the staff really revolted. Like, I was literally called a whore to my face at lunch on occasion. It was like, why are you destroying our brand? What are you doing? You're a terrible human. Uh, which I embrace. I mean, I am. So there you go. Um, so how we decided to do it was a little different than, um, than I think a lot of other publications. Uh, Forbes, I think, is one example where they just sort of threw open the floodgates and said, we'll take pretty much anyone. I mean, there's a vetting process there, and I respect a lot of the editors. I know a lot of the people who work there and are responsible for that stuff, and they do a really good job. But we wanted a little bit more control. Uh, so they really literally tasked me with saying, OK, you're going to read every pitch that comes in and sort of weigh it on its merits and see what you want to do. So I would get posts or pitches like, hold on. I do have a prop. It's, it's the last pitch I receive. Pitches like this one, I'm submitting the below and attached article on behalf of Gabby Naziri, the CEO of Ayehu, for your consideration as a contributed TechCrunch piece. 
Uh, we appreciate your time. The piece is creating a rock solid incident response plan. It takes a village. Now that we're, we're never gonna publish that. We're just never, that's never gonna go on the site. Never, ever, ever. And it never would, and anyone who had actually read TechCrunch would know that that kind of contributed piece will never, ever go on the site. But we wanted an open policy for submissions. We wanted to, to take all comers, at least initially. Uh, so we threw open the floodgates. We set up a, a page where people could just automatically submit. They would like paste their, their text into, into the submission form and then send it, and all of those emails would come to me. So I was getting <laughs> literally thousands of emails a day. Um, and trying to manage that process, um, which was, I think, uh, like a generous word would be shit show for, for the way that that worked out. Um, it was terrible. Uh, I, I mean, it was sort of terrible. Intellectually, the idea, I think, is a solid one, and I think that uh, contributors' networks have a place in um, publications because it is a chance to build a community, right? And, and the way that we approached it, the way that I approached it, was a way for the, um, the broader community of entrepreneurs and executives and artists, anyone who's like touching technology and thinking about it in a real profound way, um, can get together and talk to each other and talk to us on the site and use us as a platform to hash out ideas and think through things. Um, that was me being an idealist, not realizing that everything that involves a human endeavor will turn to crap. Um, so it did, I mean, like we got a few stellar pieces, right, so we had I had Senator Franken write a piece for us about net neutrality. Um, there was a gentleman who, um, his name is Tom Goodwin, who wrote a piece for us about the sharing economy, which was wildly popular and was quoted in a Times piece by Tom Friedman and referenced us. So those kinds of force multipliers for the brand were effective, were really great, and, um, and did, did wonders for us, actually, and really helped sort of expand our coverage and gave us voices in places we didn't have them, which is another reason or way that we use the network to sort of leverage the talents of freelancers and, and people who wanted to write for the site, who are up and coming, who might not necessarily have a platform otherwise, to really give them a voice, and, and we want to promote young talent as much as possible, and this was a good way to do it, um, and also get free shit. Um, for us and more eyeballs on the page. So, so we did that um, and that was great. We actually have hired people who came into us from the Contributors Network. One of our new young reporters is a guy named John Manis who came to us from Michigan State um, and started, he just pitched me blind and, uh, and he was good enough and I worked with him and now he's, he's on staff. So that, that turned out well. We had Franken write for us, we had Nas write for us if any of you are hip hop fans. Um, He's, a, he's an investor now, he has his own fund, God bless him. Uh, and like investors like Vinod Kusla and some other sort of star celebrity investor, venture capitalist people, Mark Andreessen and, and others, um, Ben Horwitz as well. So, so that was the good, um, but with the good came an inordinate amount of bad. Um, that, that one pitch I showed you is, is just sort of the, or read to you is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the amount of terrible copy that we got. And, um, as, as the sort of lone person manning the, the gates and making sure that the stuff that got through wasn't completely awful or wasn't awful at all, actually, it was fairly good, um, it was a lonely and tough job. Uh, and it became sort of untenable uh, to manage that much, that much copy flow. So we wound up killing it um, in the sense that we are no longer taking um, taking contrib uh, like just open contributions. And the way that we're working it now is a little bit more um, curated, which is probably what we should have done from the beginning, but I was feeling my way through this. It was my, my first sort of big editorial position. Um, so there we go. Uh, and what we're doing now is reaching out to folks that we see who have an online presence of some sort, whether it's large or small, and, and asking them to do stories for us. And in many cases, the answer is no, why would I want to do that? I have my, my own shit to do and this is a waste of my time. But in many cases, we actually do get uh, fairly positive responses because I think that ideal of, um, of having a network in a place where a forum for communication where people can talk to each other through the site and on the site and float ideas is one that, that people are receptive to, right? Um, and I think you see a lot of other properties that have done 
a much better job than we have. I, I would mention the Times, for one, who they have a, a sort of vast network of, of folks who contribute not just through the op-ed pages, but they have the Stone and they have all of these other sort of niche sites that are involved in, in conversations around philosophy and various and sundry other things. So um, it can work and it does work, and that's the sort of model that we're doing now. Um, and the reason why I started with the pitch for you to pitch me is because I will still take uh, submissions from young people who are just starting out in the industry, and I'd like to get those voices on the site. I still want to do that. So that, that project is still very much a part of, of what we want to do with contributors, because that is part of the conversation as well. Um, but we don't want to open it up to um, you know random executive or PR flack for executive who is pitching us on something that is incredibly self-serving and wildly self-promotional, right? Which is what I think ends up happening in a lot of cases with, with contributors, whether, whether uh, you know, with, with either malice or, or, or without, um, that tends to be the way that things work out. And what we found is that, or what I found is that a lot of these executives are willing to contribute and willing to write to things that they understand um, if you give them the context and you say, hey, look, you're a smart guy, you know this stuff really well, we'd love to get your words on this on the site, but just don't pitch your company. Like, uh, make sure that you're actually talking to an issue or a problem. So um, that is the endeavor that we're embarking on now going forward. And um, it's been a pretty interesting process. There's been not as much pushback as I thought there'd be around, uh, around this approach that we're taking now. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that works. Um, the other thing that we're experimenting with, um, with contributors is, is looking at different formats as well. So not just articles, um, which is pretty standard, but as sort of the plethora of platforms um, expands um, in terms of the types of ways in which people want to engage and reach an audience with storytelling. Um, we're working with podcasters now, we're working with um, doing some stuff around video, but that I think is a little bit more intensive and there aren't that many people who are like, hey, here's a video, we'll give it to you for free. Um, that <laughs> sadly doesn't happen as often as I would like. Um, but, but that's the way that we've approached things and, uh, and we'll see how it works out. Um, that was our experience. This is what I've been doing for the past two and a half years and, and we'll see what happens going forward. So there's my story, I'm sticking to it. If y'all have any questions, feel free to pepper them. Questions, pepper you can go ahead them. and raise your hand if you, if you do. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, yeah, well, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> so, um, do the folks in the newsroom still call you a whore? No, not anymore. No, 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 no. no, they, they've, they've gotten over that. <laughs> it wasn't in the newsroom, it was over lunch, but you know. Oh. So is, 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 the, is the fact that you have a different approach to it now that it's more curated? Uh... I, I think that, that that's a, a large part of it. Um, frankly, with the amount of copy that came in, it, it had expanded, it sort of metastasized. Um, so when it started, we were running maybe uh, one or two contributed pieces a day, um, and then three on the weekends. Um, on Saturday, three on Saturday, three on Sunday, which is you know, a hefty amount of content, but not overwhelming. But it had gotten to the point where we were just um, becoming more of a content machine than I wanted to, partly because that was the, the dictate or edict from, from the boss. Um, the bosses wanted us to, to pump out stuff. Um, and to the extent that we could, while still maintaining some level of quality <clears throat> and some control, we did that. There was a, a lot of argument around um, whether or not we should throw open the gates and just have people literally give people access to the platform and have them publish. Um, and then I, I think I, I would have been murdered in my sleep if, I had, if that had actually been a thing that had, had even sort of remotely, um, <laughs> if that had even been floated among, among the reporting staff, like people would have killed me. It wouldn't, it was, that wouldn't have been, there would be no argument, I just wouldn't be here today. Um, so we, we, were very, we were very sort of cognizant of, of, of the brand. And strangely enough, like there's, for as goofy as we can be sometimes, and we can be really goofy, um, people are very protective in the shop around what TechCrunch is and means and stands for and whatever. So um, we try to maintain that and be true to that as much as we can. 
and so the curated stuff helped with that. Yeah, so that, that's sort of a continuation. So contributed content, can it actually empower your, your journalists, your reporters to do better work, more work, spend more hours at work? You know, because, you know, there's this argument that, oh, well, contributors will take jobs away right. from journalism, right? And yet there is, there is an argument that could be made that says contributed content can allow journalists to do better work that gets more eyeballs, that does more. Um, Yes and no, right? I, I, because to I, the argument or to yeah, the, yeah to, I mean, it, to to your your supposition that yes, it can it can encourage journalists to do more. Um, I mean, pretty much everyone on staff did view it as sort of a threat. Um, I'm no no doubt. Um, they were like, we have jobs and we do this for a living, and these assholes are going to come on the site and and opine on stuff, and it's going to be terrible. Um, and um, and that that was definitely a part or subtext to a lot of the criticism. Um, but it turns out that that paid content or quality content really does matter, right? Um, and you can't you can't I think build a successful and sustainable publication running just listicles. Um, it doesn't work. Um, your audience will leave. And and what we found with a lot of the contributed stuff was that um, there there was a sense that people would would come in for the quick hit, but not stay on the site. And um, a lot of it is just sort of factory farming. And the other issue with contributors is you do get into sort of provenance. And there, there are just so many uh, I's to dot and T's to cross when you're thinking, when you're vetting these people. Like, how, who is this person? What do they work for? Who have they worked with? Like, how many of these companies that they mention in the piece are companies that they have either been an employee of or an investor in or what have you, right? And so trying to unpack that, and I wound up doing a lot of reporting on the contributors just to see who these people were and why they were writing about what they were writing about because everyone to me is suspect, right? Like all of these people, if you're gonna give me something for free, immediately in my mind as a reporter is like, there's no way, this is way too good to be true, nothing is free. Um, and, and that was a, sort of a personal issue that, that I went through and I would unpack like every story that we accepted and I would go back and forth with guys a lot and sort of tease out like, what is your relationship to these guys? Have you been paid by them before? Are you being paid by someone who is being paid by them? Like how, you know, really trying to tease out um, who was what and why they were doing what they were doing. And in, in many cases, like my faith in humanity was restored and reaffirmed because guys were just like, I really care about this issue and people should know about it. Um, and in other cases, it was like, well, my company does it. So that's why I'm writing about it. And in those cases, I'm like, well, that's great, but we're not gonna publish it. Um, so that, that would happen, I think, more often than not. And, and that, I think, is also um, part of the tension with contributors. And, and the way that we also published, I think, was an issue as well, because we had them running on site um, in the river, um, which I think intellectually for, for our reporters on staff was like, this is, real, this is our real estate. And if we had set it up with sort of a separate brand, which eventually we did, we had a, a sort of website where, where the things lived on their own, as well as running sort of in the river, and that made people feel a little bit more comfortable with it because it was like, oh, there's, there's an actual brand around it, it's its own thing, and we're trying to keep it as separate as possible from, from the, the reporting that was on site. Um, there's like one or two more minutes left if anybody has another question, or I can just ramble at y'all for another <laughs> minute or two. I had a question. Sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an avid TechCrunch reader. Um, Thanks, buddy. <laughs> sure. Uh, I can't help but notice so much of it is just sort of, um, uh, gossip of the valley in Silicon Valley yep. and, and I'm, it makes me it makes me wonder how someone outside of the valley can contribute you know you, you issued an open call for right. con contributions from students in mid-Missouri yeah know, how 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 is that going to work uh, well I mean it, it, you you pitch me like it, it's really it, it, again part of the the benefit of having the process be as flat as it was is that I get to make editorial decisions and they really are my decision yeah and that comes back and bites me in the ass when people call me a word of my face can you but give, I mean uh, can you give those students a, an idea of what kind of story could be pitched that you'd actually publish I mean that, alongside a, your your uh, yeah. Silicon Valley yeah. Well, I, I mean, so the way that gets into sort of the mission of what TechCrunch is and does, um, which is an interesting and evolving discussion that we have, we have amongst ourselves all the time. But um, we try to be a site that um, 
exposes um, and and promotes entrepreneurs as they're getting started with the cool shit that they're doing, right? So um, that can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be the Valley. In fact, I, I grew up in Louisiana um, and, and I'm a huge proponent of entrepreneurship and, and tech investment and tech development that comes from outside of the Valley. I'm a huge proponent of that. I would love to spend my days writing about like companies from everywhere else if I could. Chicago, St. Louis, you know, Columbia, um, wherever there's a good, wherever there's like a good company, we'd like to be able to cover it and we'd like to be the first people to tell that story, right? Um, and we have a pretty good, we have an incredibly good relationship with the, the Valley folks that do that. I'm over. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's the goal. I don't know about Zapier, uh, but I would love to. I mean, like, that's the thing. Pitch me. Um, it's really that simple. Um, so, yeah. Thank you all very much for the time. I hope John. it wasn't too terrible. Thank you. No, it was good. It was good. And you didn't embarrass me. <laughs>